So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Forward Fix live workshop using our most popular feature to put humans in control of the network. Before we begin, just want to remind everyone that if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat window and we'll answer them after the workshop. Oop. Okay. So networking and network operations is extremely difficult. You need to know a great deal of detail and granular information to quickly make decisions. This information is gathered from, from a very large number of devices, most often through CLI, which is very inefficient and adds to the complexity. Networking teams have been burdened for decades with these issues because operations are slow and complex with very limited visibility. In today's world, networking teams need to know what they have, how they're connected, where they connect, and if they are functioning with the proper intent. This is where we've helped other organizations and can help you too. Forward Networks exists to enable companies to manage this network complexity by giving, getting them on the path from reacting to problems with manually driven processes towards proactive operations with automated processes that reduce network outages, MTTR, and risk. The simple way to explain it is that we've built the world's most accurate network model. You can think of this model as a digital twin of the network. This digital twin is a complete software representation of the physical network. This calculates what if scenarios and consider choices and enables our customers to make the right decisions quickly. It tells you something truly useful, and in most cases, something you didn't even knew it, know existed, but needed to know. With that, I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, Derek Winkworth, who will take you through the rest of the webinar. All right, thanks, Pat. You got it. All right, let's do, uh, see if I can share a screen today. Top two here. Can you see the uh, app or no? Yep, we see it. All right, excellent. Um, <clears throat> so hello everyone, I'm Derek Winkworth. I'm a technical solutions architect here at uh, Ford Networks and uh, today we're going to talk about uh, network query, our network query engine feature inside of our um, inside of our platform. So before we get started, um, I'll just orient you on on what you're seeing the the user interface. This is the landing page uh, after you log in, and you're looking at our demo network, right? This is a, a visual representation of our of our demo network. It's um, like Patrick said, we build a model of the network, this digital twin in software. And the way we do that is we periodically re go out to your infrastructure, uh, firewalls, load balancers, routers, switches, uh, like, you know, a whole bunch of different vendors that we support. And we collect uh, all configuration and state from all those devices. We also do this in the cloud uh, for, for all three, uh, Google, Azure, and um, Amazon. And we pull this information in, all the information we need in order to build um, this, this model of your forwarding plane, of how your network is actually forwarding, filtering, and mutating traffic. So um, up here, we can see this is date, uh, the date and the time, this dropdown represents the date and the time that we reached out um, to our demo network and collected that information in order to build that model. And this is the, like I said, the visual representation of that model. Um, so this is, uh, by the way, uh, all browser-based UI, it's HTML5, it's very sleek, very responsive. Um, it's just a very, um, you know, very good looking UI. You can zoom in, you can move around, um, look at devices, you can click on things to get more detail. And uh, in fact, let's, let's do that now. Let's, let's click on this device and we can show you the kinds of information we actually collect. Um, we collect the configuration. Uh, this is a Junos device. Um, if you're familiar with Junos, you see the system clause here. There are things missing from the system clause, uh, like usernames, passwords, and AAA authentication, um, because uh, we have we offer the ability for customers to um, 
filter that information out before it gets to the platform, right? Because some talk about because some customers don't want that information stored, um, you know, anywhere, um, especially in the cloud uh, where we we um, provide access to this platform. However, you can also uh, use a VM version of our of our software, which is functionally identical. It can run on site, and uh, and if you want to run. Um, different kinds of verification and compliance checking against that sensitive information, like our passwords encrypted with the right cipher, our passwords configured on BGP neighbors, et cetera. Um, then you can run that locally on site. Uh, you can enable the retention of that sensitive information and then do compliance checking on it. Um, we also collect various kinds of running state, ARP tables, interface tables, route tables, uh, VRF tables, everything you need to build this, this model of the forwarding plane. Um, you need to collect the state, right? Because obviously there's um, numbers and addresses and things that are learned or generated on the fly that are not present in the config. And so it's not really possible to model how your network is forwarding traffic um, if you don't collect that information. Um, and that model, by the way, that we're building, right? Uh, it, it really has, it's, think of it as a coin with two sides, right? There's, uh, we, and we offer ways to interface with this model from, in two different ways, in two different directions. One is a behavioral direction, which, which we're not covering today, but, and the other is the data model, right? So when we collect all this information, whether it's Junos or Cisco or, you know, any of these, um, Vendors that are represented here, Juniper, Amazon, Arista, VMware, uh, we have F5, Cisco ASAs, Palo Alto. Um, whenever we collect the information from those devices, we normalize it bef and before we put it into our into the data model side of our, of our model. And what do we mean by normalize? Well, if you're a network engineer, you know, um, you know, you've logged into this vendor's device or that vendor's device, or, you know, maybe you logged into the cloud, you're looking at MAC address information for instances out in the cloud. Um, MAC addresses are always represented differently on different vendors, right? Sometimes it's all uppercase, right? For the, um, for the letters, sometimes it's lowercase, sometimes there's dots, and sometimes there's colons separating portions of the MAC address. Um, when we say we normalize it, we mean we create a single representation um, that's consistent across all vendors within our data model. And we do that for all things, not just MAC addresses. So um, <clears throat> we have three primary, uh, like, I guess, uh, apps or, or functions inside of our application. We have search, we have predict, and we have verify. Um, and today we're, we're talking about verify. And within verify, uh, we have uh, a number of different um, ways to do network verification, right? We have what we call intent. That's more on the behavioral side of the model. That's ensuring that a path exists between point A or point B, regardless of what's in the middle. Can a packet get from point A to point B um, using certain IP addresses, ports, et cetera? Um, or in, inversely, um, are you are you assuring that no path is available? Like for security reasons, you might not want SSH access to your web servers from the internet, right? So you want to create a check that says, you know, that should not exist. Um, so, but that's on the behavioral side. That's that's analyzing how packets are forwarded and stuff, um, forwarded, filtered, and modified. Um, the checks that we're going to look at today, the network verification checks today, are what we call um, NQE verification or network query engine verification. And that is um, more on the data side, like how can you interrogate the data model we use to build um, that, that forwarding model on the other side of that coin. So um, we'll go ahead and click on NQE library. Before we get into some use cases, I'm just gonna show you real quick uh, what it looks like um, to actually make these, uh, these queries. You can see um, on the screen here on the left-hand side, we have a directory structure in which um, we can organize um, the different queries that we write and apply to the system. So here we have um, layer one, layer two, layer three, some vendor specific queries for Cisco around uh, NXOS features, CDP, um, BGP route maps, you know, using uh, Cisco syntax. And then 
we have some org specific. These are when you create a query, this is where uh, they're placed somewhere under the org repository directory. And we have a variety of, um, of, of scripts here. Um, things for BGP security, again, they're all together. There's about, uh, you know, a few hundred NQE queries that are, that are available out of the box uh, uh, with our platform. In the middle, this is where you do all the editing of your scripts. Um, if you're familiar with anything like, you know, writing scripts in Python or uh, writing code in Go or whatever your preferred language is, um, you, you probably have an IDE you're writing in, something like Notepad++ or PyCharm, um, Vim, right? Uh, something like that. And there's usually plugins that go along with those uh, with those editors that do correct syntax highlighting for different kinds of uh, languages or files. Well, you don't need that with um, with the NQE queries uh, with Ford because everything is embedded right in the browser. You have the editor, and you have all of the syntax highlighting there, and it's always current, right? It's always up to date. So very very easy to do all your editing here. On the right-hand side, um, you have all the documentation you need. Again, um, I can't tell you how many times I have an IDE open on one screen and then I have a, a browser open on the other and there's like 30 tabs open because um, every, you know, I gotta keep looking stuff up. And then, you know, if I look something up and now I gotta go back and read it again because I'm getting to the part where I'm actually gonna use it. And then I gotta figure out which tab, right? I open that in, I do that all the time. I end up with like 50 tabs open. Um, but everything you need, all the documentation you need to write NQE queries is right in the browser. Again, you have a data model here. This is um, the schema of our data model. And uh, what's really nice about this is, uh, let's see, we'll go down here to platform vendor, right? So there's a, a part of our, our data model that's devices.platform.vendor. And that tells you who the vendor is of that piece of hardware or or uh, that element inside of your network. And what are the possible values? We'll, we'll go ahead and click that. And you can see here, of course, we support Amazon. Um, we support a variety of open source and, and white box networking devices, HP, Avaya, Cisco, Riverbed, Fortinet, uh, you know, Citrix, A10. We, there's all, you know, quite a few in there that we support. Those are all the possible values of this piece of, of this, um, in this place in the data model. And if you want an example of how to query that, uh, that piece of data, you can just click on the circle icon next to it, click see example, and it brings up a, a very generic piece of code, which you can actually copy to your clipboard and, uh, and then paste into your, into your uh, editor. So this is a great way to navigate the data model. It makes it very easy to uh, understand what you need to do to, to use a piece of, of information. We have some, uh, tutorial documentation on the language itself, um, the syntax of, you know, the various keywords and stuff in the language. It's about 10 pages. It, it is a tutorial, not a reference. So um, it's a very e easy language to learn. There's a lot of examples in here as well on different things you can do, ex explaining all the syntax. And then finally, we have a variety of examples, about a dozen or 14 or so examples here. And then we have a GitHub re repository with even more examples that's open to the public. So again, everything you need to write an NQE query is embedded right in the browser and it makes it very easy to use. All right, so what can we actually do with NQE? Well, uh, we'll start with, um, you know, common mistakes that people make, right? One of our favorite things to do here at Ford, um, when we get a, we actually get a customer, um, you know, into a, into a uh, proof of concept scenario, um, we have them turn on MTU consistency, right? So uh, let's go ahead. Well, actually, this is the NQE library down here where we do all the editing. I'm gonna go back up to verify NQE where we actually apply uh, these scripts to the network. And we're gonna look at MTU consistency down here. And we can see that it's failing because of course it's our demo network. We have tons of failure <laughs> in our demo network. It's a, it's a dumpster fire of a network. And we'll go ahead and say only cases where it's true that where there's a mismatch, and we can see um, there's actually two links that have mismatches. Um, uh, there's four lines, but it counts each link in each direction for the mismatch in this query. So there's actually with four lines, there's there's two mismatches. We can see here one on this link, there's it's 9,200 bytes on the other is 1,500. We can actually verify that by clicking the interface, right? We click Ethernet two of this device 
And uh, we can see that our platform's telling us here that it's 9200 bytes. And if we wanna see the actual interface details that show us this, um, on the right-hand side, when you click on this, it takes you right to the output that tells us what that MTU is and it highlights it, right? So there's no confusion. You can see right off the platform, it's in fact reporting 9,200 bytes. So very, very, um, you know, handy check. Uh, we find people are convinced a lot of times they don't have that issue or it's minimal if they have it at all. And then they turn it on and they have hundreds of mismatches, right? That's very good to know. So um, we'll go ahead and we'll look at another one. Um, Interfaces should have descriptions. We'll go ahead and we'll click that one, right? We have a failure here. Again, we can click that. And we see um, there's a number of devices that have uh, interfaces here. Like here's an interface here, uh, a sub-interface that has no description. So what what is this sub-interface? What is this VLAN, right? What is it for? You don't know. So um, if you have a, an interface description standard, um, if you have a policy that all interfaces, including subinterfaces, should have a description, well, this is very, very handy. And what's great, um, you can click with any NQE query, you can click download report here. It'll download a CSV file with this report. And what you can do is, uh, is take that CSV file, attach it to a ticket, right? Open it up and assign it to a network engineer and start plugging away to get it fixed. Um, very, very, very handy. So, you know, there's also a variety of security applications, right, for NQE. And uh, we'll start with a pretty simple one, I think. Um, we'll, we'll close this out. And we'll go to security here. And let's say you have uh, a policy that says, I don't want any uh, access lists with permit any any in the, uh, you know, in their, in the, in their uh, policy. So we see find permit any any here. We're gonna go ahead, uh, it's failing of course. We're gonna click fail. And we can see here the device, the name of the ACL and the actual line, it says uh, access list in underscore outside extended permit IP any any. Well, this is actually our edge firewalls in this case. So, you know, is traffic going outbound? That's a pretty common rule to have in place uh, to permit that to permit that kind of traffic. Um, so, you know, that's very, very handy. Um, and it's important to point out uh, that every single time we go out and we collect all this information from your network via SSH or NetCom for API calls, or whatever it is, uh, BMP, right? Um, whatever is required to get all the information we need to build that model, we go out periodically to do that. It could be uh, once a day, it could be twice a day, it could be every hour, or every couple hours. And you can retain all of those uh, historical snapshots over time. But every single time you run, go and, and do this collection or the platform does the collection, um, it runs all of these checks against your network, right? So if you have a rule that says there should not be any fine permit any any's um, and you get out of a change window and you run a collection, it'll audit your network, right? And, and look for any, any entries that might've been added that, that permit any any traffic. Um, and so what other, what other uh, security things might you want to run, right? Um, every single day or after every single change window? Well, um, what if you want to make sure that BGP neighbors are authenticated, right? So we have one here, Junos uh, BGP authentication. We'll go ahead and we'll enable that. And oh no, it's failing. So we have here, um, these are all the devices that have BGP peers that are that don't have passwords configured, right? All the Junos devices that have BGP peers with no password configured. Um, again, download the report, send it off, go yell at somebody or <laughs> whatever, you know, whatever it takes to get it fixed. And, um, you know, very, very handy. Um, again, you know, that's very, that's a very common mistake. Bringing up BGP peers, not adding authentication, you're in a hurry, uh, but there's a policy that says it's gotta be in there. Um, Interfaces configured up, uh, but they're down. So that's another one um, I really like. We'll go and click interfaces here. Um, 
go ahead and click that. Uh, this is actually a, a big security problem, right? It's, I mean, it could, it's a network hygiene issue, but it can also be a, uh, a network security issue. You go click failed. And these are all the interfaces in the network that are configured up, uh, but they're down. Um, you know, anyone could walk up to one of these ports and plug in a laptop or some other device, um, you know, uh, a rogue wireless access point or something like that. And uh, you, you wouldn't want that, right? So um, that's, you know, this is a very handy report, especially, you know, obviously in a campus environment, but could be in the core environment as well. So um, the last one I'll show you, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, we, you, you can look for things like, um, you know, do you have the wrong firmware version um, on, your, on your device? We'll go ahead and we'll look that up. Uh, let me look for, that's what we're looking for. Oop. Out here in security, um, you can have, uh, here we have an F5 P cert. We'll, can, we'll click that. Um, this is failing. We'll go ahead and click it. And it's telling us that these two devices are, uh, you know, they have the wrong firmware version. Let's go ahead and look at the code of this one. Um, in here, <clears throat> we have defined a list of versions that are vulnerable based on uh, vulnerability notifications from F5. Um, some versions that are patched. And then we basically iterate through all the devices in the model, um, looking for F5 devices in particular, and then comparing the reported platform version with these lists that we've to see which devices are running ver versions that are vulnerable and which ones are running versions that are patched. And, uh, and then it spits out the report. So you can do this with, you know, any vendor, um, you know, it's to make sure that uh, the right things are, they're all writing the right code. Again, you know, a change window, 2.30 in the, or 2 in the morning, uh, someone might pull a device right out of the box, right? They might put it in the rack, power it on, and they don't update the firmware, right? They just dump the config on and walk away, not realizing that the default uh, firmware could be a vulnerable version. Um, and as soon as you, again, run that collection at the end of your configuration window or, you know, in the next cycle, in the next couple hours or, you know, at the end of the day, you'll get a report telling you that, hey, you know what, this new device, it, um, you know, it's just got the wrong version of, of uh, firmware on it. So I've shown you uh, down here in the NQE library a little bit earlier, all the ways that you can, uh, all the ways that, uh, how to edit it, how to um, do everything just inside the browser, but you can also do things uh, from the command line, right? Um, all these scripts are, are in, can be run from the command line. Um, so here we have a script uh, defined EOS uh, root NQE. We'll uh, have a look at it. It's the exact same script as the one we just looked at, that F5P cert one. So you can have this in a GitHub directory where you, know, you can maintain them rather than inside the platform. Um, and then you can actually pass this whole script to um, the forward app through the API and, and get a report back, which we'll do right now with this uh, Python script. We'll do uh, see like oh, Python three CLI create pi, and boom, it gives us the exact same information that we got uh, when we ran it inside the platform. But now it's it's running it, uh, you know, from the command line. So all of this is accessible. Uh, through the API. So if you have a, um, you know, if, if you want to autumn, if you have a, like something like a CICD pipeline or you're, or you're building one, you're building a NetOps, DevOps practice around the network. Um, all of this checks, all of these checks can be run through the API inside of that automated pipeline. So that's, you know, it's very handy. In fact, we have a few customers that are doing exactly that um, uh, right now. Uh, so if, you know, if that's something that that's appealing to you or interesting to you, you know, please reach out to us. We have uh, some great examples of how to, how to accomplish that. So, you know, that it's a pretty short and sweet um, presentation on how to use NQE um, to, uh, you know, address security issues, common uh, configuration mistakes, et cetera. Uh,
um, it's you know it really enables uh, network op network organizations to stay on top of you know uh, config creep right things uh, things that or config um, is it called config creep I'm going to call it config creep for this uh, for this webinar um, you know every single every single week when especially in a large organization right you have so many network engineers security engineers low balancer engineers people managing cloud infrastructure. And, you know, you have organizational standards and you want people to do the right thing. But over time, you know, these MTU mismatches, VLAN mismatches, um, you know, uh, incorrect BGP configurations, all these things creep over time. Like there's one here, there's one here, and they build up. Um, and then when it comes time to do an audit, um, then it's, you know, you got to scrub your network looking for all the mistakes you've made in the past year or the past two years or whatever is last you were audited. And you got to come. You got to schedule time to go in and and um, and fix all those things, and hope that you got them all right. But with four networks, you can define all these things um, as NQE checks um, inside the browser, or like I said, outside inside of GitHub repository, and then run them via API. And uh, you know, you can every single time you run a collection, um, these checks are being run. So you're essentially auditing your network on a daily or uh, semi-daily basis, which uh, which is reassuring. So if you know next time someone comes to you and says, "Hey, are we compliant? Um, is this an issue?" Then you can pull that up right away. You can download the report and you have that information um, without going through the regular process, uh, which is often you know very tedious. It's a lot of work, a lot of searching, um, involves sometimes a lot of people to make sure that everything is is um, is squared away. So that's. Um, that's our presentation in a nutshell, and uh, we'll we'll switch it over to some Q and A. Awesome! Th thanks so much, Derek. That was great. So we do have a few questions, and um, in, in in the Q and A uh, box here. So um, the first question was or is: Can you run queries external to the platform? So I'm guessing the question is around. You know, on some of our other customers, what they're doing is they're integrating this into their CI CD pipelines, for instance. So, you know, as the cutover happens or some automated process happens in the background, can you have this automatically query the platform, the forward platform on, on this? I guess that's the question. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I was uh, trying to trying to show earlier is, um, you know, this is we're actually sitting on the on the CLI of our of my of my Mac here. And um, I have a simple CLI query Python script that I've uh, I've written. It, uh, it so you can actually generate the Python client library for any version of our platform using Swag or CodeGen. If you're familiar with that, if you're if you're thinking about CI/CD pipelines and, and automation, uh, you probably know what Swagger is. Swagger is an API uh, definition tool, right? It, it defines the API. What what can you do to the what kind of operations can be performed on the API? Um, what kind of data um, for each of those operations, and um, it's a, it's I think it's called Open API now. And what you can do with that is uh, you can generate um, a client library in any language using a tool called Swagger CodeGen. In this case, I've generated that client library using um, using uh, to use Python, and then I've just written a simple script that passes uh, in, uh, this NQE query. to the API, uh, uh, to the platform where it's executed and the results are returned, um, you know, back to the uh, back to the Python script and then dumped to the screen here. So let's, let's run that again. Right, and you can see here um, which devices are running vulnerable firmware inside, the, inside of our demo network. Wonderful. Cool, Th thanks, Derek. The second um, question here, can you automatically generate queries? Is there an automated way of creating these? Um, there's a couple different ways. Well, uh, that's so we have this on the roadmap. Uh, we do have a feature coming soon that allows you to interactively create these queries without writing code. Um, I, I don't want to, you know, take the lid off that, but uh, we'll. <laughs> There is, uh, it's not really automated, but it's a way to generate um, scripts without having to write code. Yeah, and I think I, I, I think that's probably what the question was. So there'll be like some 
in the GUI itself, I would imagine there's just like a kind of a point and click kind of um, flow chart where you can create queries like VLAN or IP or something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. fact, we'll probably do a follow up um, when that comes out. We'll probably do an update um, uh, presentation on that. Great. But um, that that is that is coming down the pipe. Okay, great. Um, this wasn't a question, but uh, you know, tailing on that question, I guess the next logical question would be: Is there is there PS available? Um, you know, if I get this in my system and I want help with writing these queries, or is there training? Is that available? Oh yeah, so um, uh, so so we have a, we have a number of uh, of um, team people on our team that, that can help you. Um, you have your TSA, he's a frontline uh, person who you interact with, um, you know, frequently about you know uh, how you use the platform, what you're trying to achieve, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of our all of our um, TSAs are are versed in NQE. But then we do have um, NQE experts on staff that will uh, that will help you with you know any mission critical queries that you want to write, um, and they they can get you through that process. And they've written some pretty elaborate queries that, uh, for instance, they can check to see if um, any route maps you know on a Cisco device um, are referencing non-existent access list or prefix list, right? Because that that's mm -hmm. also a security problem. Um, because that when uh, when you reference a non-existence access list, that is a permissive entry inside the route map, and and so you want to check for that. And uh, so they've written you know really complex queries to check for that kind of thing, and they can they can walk the customer through how that's written and uh, ensure that it's it's meeting their needs and accomplishing their goals. Okay, great. So that was the balance of the questions. Before everyone, before everyone leaves, I did want to uh, quickly share uh, my screen, and um, we've got some really cool tools on our on on our website right now. Um, the one I want to talk about really quickly is our enterprise ROI calculator. So, Derek, do you see that? I'm sharing the. Um, Yep, I see. Here. Yeah, so guys, this is really cool. Come, you know, go over to forwardnetworks.com slash cost calculator. Um, and, you know, some of these things, you know, you might say, well, how, how, does, how much is forward going to save me? Well, here's a tool here where you can input all these different, fee, um, you know, uh, numbers and actually kind of get an idea of what this, what this cost savings could be you know, with a forward in your network. So I thought this was really neat. This is a new tool. I guess in the last few months we came out with this. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is our forwardnetworks.com slash podcast. Yes. So I've listened to all of these. These are great. Derek co-hosts these as well. They're great. Um, the Bill Krause one, I mean, I was, it was just an amazing, <laughs> they're all really good interviews, but if you guys are familiar with Bill Krause, I mean, it's awesome. There is an awesome anecdote in there about Steve Jobs that I just, I was on the floor laughing being an XX uh, network engineer. So check that out. Again, it's forwardnetworks.com slash podcast. And then finally, um, you know, we have a, you can request a demo. So if there are any, I mean, we've got a whole slew of features and we'll do a proper demo for you. If you guys are interested, come to our website, you know, request a demo. I, I think every page on our website has this. So fill it out. You know, we'll be happy to get on a private call with you guys and um, give you a demo and we could dive into any of the features you want to see. So with that, with that rather, um, just want to um, let you know, if, like from our top tier service providers to global financial services, Fortune 500 companies trust forward networks to save them from troubleshooting headaches and avoidable network outages. So I want to say thanks again, Derek, appreciate it. Thanks for all you guys joining today. We're gr glad you were here with us and have a great remainder of the day. We'll hopefully see you soon. Take care.